Hello and welcome to Space Doc Jury Minisode. Um, this is a very different Minisode. Um, this week uh, we will be remembering the visual effects genius Ron Thornton. Uh, uh, but, but before we do that, let me introduce who else is here because I'm just talking off the top of my head and that's really not a great way to start this podcast, is it? It, it is pretty part of the course though. Yeah, pretty part <laughs> of the course. So anyway, hello Andy. Hello, Lee. How are you? I'm fine. And to add extra confusion to the matter, we are joined by another Lee, Lee Stringer. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Lee, hello. Lee Two here. Lee Two. Lee Two reporting in. <laughs> yeah. you, might, you, you might recall Lee from previous podcasts, such as the Battlestar Galactica one. So there you go. Yes. 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 Where, where basically we just sat back and he told us everything we wanted to know about the Galactica and to the point where actually we wanted to make that like a multi-part episode it, 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 yeah part two coming shortly but um, <laughs> yeah very that, good yeah that's down the line but we wanted to just take a moment and remember Ron because you might not recognize the name but you'll certainly know the work because you know he worked on Star Trek Babylon 5 all yeah. the way back to Blake 7 but, and before that Doctor Who and Doctor Who yep. but the, the thing's very yeah, very and space balls and spe- well, well, let's not mention that around. Yeah, me. I was going to say, come on, ste- <laughs> steady on now. Let's remember the man fondly. <laughs> but what I just wanted to say was, none of us, I think it's safe to say, would know each other without Ron Thornton. Correct. No, because that's absolutely it, right. it, it was Babylon Five. I think got all of us into CGI to an extent. You know, visual effects and light wave. Yes, made Back it possible. Yes. Yes. Because, yeah. yeah, because it was affordable. <laughs> it yeah. was affordable, but you could suddenly see what could be done. Yes. Yeah. And and it was it was from it. And and again. I, I think again, it's safe to say, no Ron Thornton, no Babylon Five. Right. Yep. I think at least not the Babylon it. Five that we know. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So what, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. Straczynski had been kind of shipping it around for a good five or six years before he hooked up with Ron, trying yes. to sell it, and it was it was having that visual element, which kind of gave it the extra impetus to, oh, actually, yeah, okay, maybe this will work. Right. It's especially with the with the budget that they had, you know, because mm-hmm. of course, mm. you know, they were. I mean, I'm not going to say they were going up against Trek, but I mean, you know, Trek was, you know, Next Gen was the the big the big boy in town, as it, it were. It was the big so, fish in the pond. <laughs> yes, yeah. and uh, and and you know, they had a a budget that was substantially lower than, than Star Trek had at the time. Um, Mind blowingly, you know, Babylon 5's, I don't I don't know what Babylon 5's budget was, but I know it was very low. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, but but they wanted they you know Joe had a, a a big universe, a big vision that he wanted to try and get on screen. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, trying to do it with models and miniatures, it just never, it, th- th- they wouldn't have been able to afford it. And it, it wouldn't have looked, it wouldn't have worked. No. Um, and, um, yeah, Ron kind of said, hey, we should try this thing out. Yeah, because he had, because pr- he'd previously worked with um, Joe Straczynski um, doing some CGI effects for Captain Power. Right. Which, uh, which uh, back in the uh, right way back in the nineteen nineties when um, early eighties, uh, late eighties, wasn't it, no, Captain Power? Yeah, I, I don't know. It was. <laughs> I'd have to double check the actual ninety two. Yeah, I, I believe think it was early nineties. Yeah, I think yeah, eighty seven yeah. to eighty eight. Wow, oh, really? There, there you go. go. Uh, right, the and... power of the internet it <laughs> yes. everybody. Man, man looks up stuff on internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, but the thing that the thing that really kind of well, brought us together and put Ron squarely right at the front of like the cutting edge of visual effects. And obviously, yes. Lee, you know him better than knew him better than any of us. So mm-hmm. feel free to just walk straight over me and start talking. <laughs> but was was the fact that Lightwave three D by New yes. Tech was was a was cheap enough, yes, and ran on a platform that pretty much at that point I think any any sort of computer geek child. You know, yeah, I mean, worth their you know, salt had the money to do. A lot of people don't realize that you know, basically in the early nineties, um, you know, PCs hadn't really kicked in. You no. know, PCs were around, Windows was around, um, but they weren't what we know them today. Um, Mac, you know, were around; they'd been around for a while, but they weren't as we know them today. And they were more, you know, especially the Macintosh was pretty much focused on desktop publishing and mm. dominating uh, that field. Um, but this was a time when there was lots of other manufacturers and different operating systems and different computers. You know, Atari was still a power player, um, and Commodore, you yeah. know, um, which is a name that most we all know. But I mean, a lot of people nowadays don't even know that name anymore. No. Um, but in the, the the computer graphics field, 
yes, you know, Apple and the Macintosh were dominant in the desktop publishing, but they were still pretty much in black and white mode essentially at, mm. at that time. I mean, they, they, you know, really, um, but that was where they they had their strength, so they stayed there. Um, the thing is that, that to do CGI, you know, you kind of had two options. Um, one was was to have a cray mainframe um, mm. at your at your beck and call, um, <laughs> which which not many people could do. And, and it would it would be nice, but yeah, yeah <laughs> you know. Um, and and we're we're talking about a computer that probably has less had less processing power than the phone that I'm holding has now. Mm. Um, but at the time um, was you know was called a supercomputer and, and, and the, it was in the day when a supercomputer actually kind of meant something and was yeah. in awe and and so anyway um you know obviously to to either buy or to rent by the minute or the second whatever they did those computers were incredibly expensive um the other option was to have a silicon graphics um and a silicon graphics desktop um now the thing is um most people don't realize that in the early 90s, um, a, 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 even the, a, a sort of a, a standard silicon graphics desktop could cost you $100,000 yeah. um, in US dollars. Um, um, and then, you know, to run and to buy, in, uh, you know, the, the 3D software that would be used on it. And I'm, I'm using, okay, so the, the best example is, is around the same time that, that Ron did what he, you know, Ron and Paul, uh, who were the found, uh, founders of Foundation Imaging, which was the company they formed to do the effects on Babylon 5. Um, at the same era, um, the big thing in, in CGI was was Jurassic Park. You know, yeah. Jurassic Park came oh, out yeah. in 93 and just blew the world away. The still a high is, watermark for And it graphics. still is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but, you know, the thing was, is I, I don't know the actual numbers, but the, the um, you know, the amount of the, the people, the number of staff at ILM that, that did the, the CGI on that was essentially a handful because mm. they literally only had a handful of machines. And, uh, the, you know, the software that they were using, which was uh, Alias Power Animator, which evolved into Maya, um, you know, uh, it, it also, you know, so you had to have a $100,000 work, workstation with, with a piece of software that cost pretty much the same yeah. Um, with like a, a twenty or thirty thousand dollar a year update maintenance support package. So basically, you're talking in in early nineties money, twenty five years ago, around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for one computer, one machine. Yeah. Know. Wow. <laughs> right. You know, and that's twenty five years ago money. So what would that be now? It's got to be half a million. Easy. You know? Yeah. Right. So think about you know so so if you had you know. 10 guys so suddenly you need you know the equivalent of five million dollars and that's not to hire the guys or to hire the building or to do anything that's just to have 10 machines with 10 pieces of software mm. and you're talking five million dollars the equivalent of today's sort of money so the 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 only other alternate that they had at that time were things like the commodore amiga um, and there was the Atari ST, and there was a few other computers, but none of them really had the, the desktop, you know, the, the, the potential. Hmm. So along came a thing called the Video Toaster um, from NewTek. And, ah, I remember the toasters. Right. So <laughs> bundled, and, and I'm trying to be kind of quick here, but without being boring. That's um, fine. <laughs> yeah, because you're like, oh, God, nerdy talk, whatever. But, no, no, but what no. it was was, was the, the, the Video Toaster was essentially, they called it the um, – the, the video studio in a box, you know, the, the TV station mm -hmm. in a box, basically, because it allowed the Amiga to essentially be what hundreds of thousands of do pounds, dollars uh, worth of equipment that would be in a TV studio could literally be done by a desktop computer, which was revolutionary. In fact, it was mm. called the, the desktop revolution was what they called the video toaster. And bundled with the video toaster was a piece of 3D software called Lightwave. And the thing is, is, is Lightwave was essentially kind of just a, a tack on the side because they realized that they needed something to be able to do like flying logos and text, you know, and, and have some graphics to be able to overlay onto the, the On the video. sports announcements and yeah, stuff like that, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So they, they needed, they, they realized they needed like a titling. They had like titling software to put, you know, words up and text up and, and results and whatever they needed to do. But they were like, well, it'd be really cool if there was some sort of 3D, you know, because that was coming mm. in at that time. Anyway, so the thing is, is that Ron and, and Paul, Ron specifically, 
re- was like, well, wait, I could use this to, okay, this this is being done for flying logos uh, and things like that, you know, and, and text and whatever and silly stuff. But, well, what if I built a spaceship with it? Hmm. Um, and then he played around with that and tested it. And then that was what they went to, to Joe with and basically was like, look, we – because we're not going out to film resolution, we're going out to, to broadcast resolution, which at the time was before HD. Um, these machines possibly, you know, could um, produce the graphics that you need for doing a TV show. And mm. at a, now the thing is, is a, an Amiga with a video toaster, um, I think cost at that time, even if you had like, you know, a monitor and a hard drive and, and things yeah. like that. Maybe I don't know three thousand US yeah. dollars equivalent. Yeah, yeah. Cause so you when you're comparing the... that, so you're talking a factor of around a hundred between an SGI running Alias Power Animator and a, and a Commodore Amiga running the video to- with a video toaster running Lightwave, and um, and you got a factor of a hundred. Now on, on you know that's substantial, and that you know and TV now now nowadays in in you know TV with when you've got shows like Game of Thrones and whatever with insane budgets um as, as big as films um you know obviously they can look as good as films are looking um but 25 years ago you know tv shows you know they might have an effects budget per episode of a few thousand dollars yeah um i don't again i don't know what the budgets were on babylon 5 but um so the thing is is if you've got a computer system that costs you two hundred fifty thousand, well obviously you're not going to be able to do a TV show with, with that sort of a machine. No. And um, so there was, you know, there was, that's where Ron came in and said, look, Hey, let's, I think we can do this. And, and Joe was like, okay, let's try it. You know? Mm. And um, you know, there was, there was a few shows. There was a few TV shows around the same sort of period um, that, that were experimenting. And the thing was, they were all using uh, the, the, the same, you know, the same sort of hardware. Um, you know, the, the the two, you know, the most famous one uh, other than Babylon Five was Sequest. Yeah. Uh, which oh, was yeah, done I remember by, Sequest. You know, yeah. yeah, and that was also the majority of the VFX on Sequest were also being done uh, on uh, Amigas um, on with the video toaster and, and Lightwave. So, but Babylon Five came out before that, and so it is definitely credited as being like the first main series where all the visual effects were done using a, a desktop uh, computer on TV. Um, yeah. You know, the, the first film uh, that had all of its VFX, you know, was, was a few years before that, which was The Last Starfighter. But that was done on a Cray supercomputer and mm. had a film budget. And, and so, you know, a few years later, um, it worked its way down, not down, but across to, to TV. Yeah. And Ron was the, the spearhead of that. And, you know, um yeah it, it changed tv you know it changed tv as as we know it um mm. you know uh, at first you know a lot of people were kind of skeptical of it and you could tell that it wasn't done with miniatures and and whatever but but the thing was that it allowed them it it, it the, the main thing that the cgi on, on Babylon 5 did and what, what i and you and and most of us who remember it noticed was that it removed that limitation that you had with filming miniatures. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because the, the camera could, was now free. It, you weren't limited. Now, a lot of people took that to the extreme and had cameras going all over the place and it looked horrible, but because they had filmmakers who were working on the shots and they hired people who had had, you know, had, had previous experience, they treated the, 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 the CGI camera as a real camera, but without the limitations of having, you know, uh, gravity, <laughs> you know, or, or um, support stands or wires or, or you know, motion You, you have to worry about or, telescope you know. lenses and stuff. You can just, yeah, you know, yeah. so, so <laughs> they, they used the cameras as real cameras, but with the limitations of real cameras removed. And, um, you know, it gave them a, a, a new freedom that they had. And uh, the great thing about B5 was it was the perfect sort of uh, recipe because it, it's what it needed that's what babylon 5 needed and and the second you know big thing that babylon 5 gave us um which is probably for me on a on a, on a like a um a, a sci-fi and space you know geeky person it was the first time that we saw craft spacecraft moving as 
real world things might move in space. Yeah. Newtonian physics. Right. So <laughs> you had, you know, you look at the Star Fury, um, you know, designed by Steve Berg and, and you know, Ron, you know, built that. But when you look at it, it had thrusters that went up and down and left and right and forwards and backwards. It wasn't like a spaceship that kind of flew like a, a, an airplane, um, like mm. most do. Um, it, it was designed like, well, wait, what if this was actually real? And so you had suddenly you had spacecraft that were flying backwards, you know, or flying up and down or, or going left and right. Or they could go in any direction they want. Now, you had to be careful to make sure the audience could still follow what was going on. But yeah. the thing was, is suddenly you were free to be able to, to, you were free of gravity and you were free of these restraints. And it was the first time that you saw dogfights um, between sort of like two spacecraft. Now, they were obviously not realistic because of, of cinematic, you know, it would look boring if you had a real dogfight between two spaceships. I really think it would be. Um, but at least it, it showed um, some level of realism that nobody had ever seen before. You know, nobody had ever seen spaceships flying realistically before Babylon 5, even in the cinema, um, when they were using CGI and costing 100 times the price. Um, so that, I think, it's not just the fact that using the Amiga and making it affordable and, and bringing it to TV, there was also the fact that they brought this sort of level of, of realism uh, to the movements, which hadn't been seen before. I'll I'll say this as well because uh, Steve Berg recently posted a tribute image to Ron. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and he used the original Star Fury model, which yep. is what it's near as makes no difference. Twenty five years old at this point. Yeah, it's it's almost twenty five years. And yeah. the, it still stands up really well. It's yes. like yes. Uh, at, at the time, you know, back in the days of Babylon Five, it was four by three on Amigas, video toasters, yep. and all this. But with to a take... very with with um, uh, megabytes of memory. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And only a few, a few megabytes of memory. <laughs> but it, it's got to be said that I've I've seen recent high res renders of both that Star Fury and the original Omega model, yep. and the models themselves, which are built very, very low poly compared very, to what you see very today, low poly. Yep. stand up so well. And and I yeah. think that's a testament to that kind of taking the most of what you could do with what you had. That you know someone like Ron with that, because again he comes out of the BBC. Yes, yes, exactly. exactly. So yes, it's like, yes, it, yes. I, don't, I don't want to hear it can't be done. I want to hear how can we make it happen with what we have. Yeah, yeah. And and, and that's a good example um, because, yeah, I mean, every every polygon counted, basically, mm -hmm. you know. And um, in those days, every poly, you know, every polygon counted because if you added a polygon, it took up memory and, and you only had X amount that you could use before you ran out of memory. Yeah. And, um <laughs> I, yeah. I always remember Lightwave having the uh, limitation of 65,000 points yes. on every model. Yes. <laughs> so you had, yes. To load it, you had to load things like the Star Fury in parts. Right. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Um, but also having a machine that had enough memory that you could even have 65,000. <laughs> so uh, I remember actually the, the first... Uh, the first time I really was was getting into it. now, just so anybody knows, I didn't actually work on Babylon Five. I I, no. I didn't join uh, Ron and, and Foundation Imaging uh, until after until after Babylon Five, unfortunately. But it was a huge influence on me and on hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Yep. Um, definitely thousands of people um, who to get into this career because the thing was, you know. I knew, uh, you know, when I wanted to get into to filmmaking, I wanted to build miniatures. That was, you know, what I wanted to do. Mm. And and obviously, I knew that CGI was was a thing, but it wasn't reachable to me. It wasn't. It wasn't. I, I couldn't. There was, there was no way that I was going to be able to to learn and, and to use uh, CGI. And I very very clearly remember seeing an article in I'm. I don't know if it was Starburst or Starlog, one of the early magazines, mm. um, about essentially the making of the pilot of B5. And I very, very, very you know, remember, because I had an Amiga. I had an Amiga. You know, I'd have been using an Amiga for, for several years. I knew about the toaster. Um, I didn't have a toaster because I couldn't afford one, but, <laughs> but I had an Amiga. So it was like, and I'm reading the article, and I'm looking at the pictures, and I'm looking at the screen grabs, and I'm like, I think I can do that. You know, I think I can, you know, um, I, I, or at least 
I, I'm halfway there, or at least I, 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 I can I, I can try to do that. Yeah. Um, whereas with when I'm looking at Jurassic Park and I'm looking at these SGIs and I know I'm like, there's no way that I could I could afford to to buy rent or or even borrow an SGI to be able to to go that route at that point. But I saw the the route with with the, the Amiga, the toaster, and the and, and Lightwave, and I'm like, well. That's just a couple of thousand dollars. Now, in the early '90s, to me, a couple of thousand dollars was still out of my win- you know, out of my reach. Mm. But it was at least I, I could see that. I couldn't see myself having two hundred and fifty thousand dollars anytime soon. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, but I could see the possibility that I could, and and that's how I ended up where I am today because. I was like, well, that is a path that I could work my way along. And and a lot of people saw that, and a lot of people were influenced by that. Whether they ended up actually even meeting or working with Ron and and the other guys, you know, at the Foundation Imaging, but specifically Ron, because that's who we're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and the thing was, is, is during the 90s, the early part of the 90s, you know, I, I knew about Ron and I knew about, the facility that he'd set up and I'm like, I want to go work there because yeah. they're doing cool shit. And I think I can, I can do that. I didn't know if I could, but I think I can. Um, and I spent most of the nineties really, you know, working my, and, and teaching myself 3d and, and, you know, um, with a focus of going to work at foundation imaging with Ron yeah. That was that was like that was the target on the wall, um, and it took uh, well, I said it took about six years hmm. um, because I I got hired at the beginning of 1999. Hmm. Um, now B5 was already finished by then, and they'd moved on to DS9 and Voyager um, and other shows in between. Yeah, um, and I had met a couple of people. I hadn't met Ron at this point. Um, um, but I'd met a couple of uh, his early employees, uh, Mojo and mm. John Tesca. I'd met both of them, and I was like, "I'm learning Lightwave. I'm, I, you know, I want to. I, I know what you guys are doing, and that's what I'm trying to do." And they were both like, you know, supportive, and both like, "Well, you should send us a reel when you can." And I didn't for a long time, and eventually I did, um, and uh, I sent it to Mojo, and we had some conversations, and he showed it to Ron, and Ron was like, "Yeah, bring him on." And next thing I knew, I'm traveling out to California to go work on Star Trek Voyager. Mm. You know, um, after a few very stiff drinks, um, <laughs> when I realized, you know, you know, it's it's really it's a it was the weirdest sensation. You know, literally one day you're watching Voyager on TV, and then you have a job offer to go work on it. And um, trust me, that's that was. I had a very stiff drink that day. I bet you um, did. Yeah. <laughs> was there suddenly a moment of? Okay, I've been talking myself up. Actually, hang on. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a combination of both. You know, I, I yeah, I'm, now I'm going to have to actually do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a mixed thing. So yeah, I, I headed out to, 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 I did the Beverly Hillbillies thing and loaded up the truck and moved to Beverly, well, not to Beverly, but to, mm. to Valencia, California. Nice. Um, was it Voyager? He won the Emmy for was it uh, Foundation? No, uh, Ron. Ron won the Emmy actually for Babylon Five. Okay. Um, for the pilot of Babylon Five, um, um, essentially when there wasn't really a category for that. Um, mm, yeah, he yeah. he received so, he received an award nomination for Voyager's episode. Yes, so, yes. so he had a, he had yeah. a couple of uh, um, uh, additional uh, Emmy nominations. Mm. One was before I was there, which was on um, I forget the actual name of the episode, but it was the Snow Crash episode. Timeless. That was the one yeah. I was thinking of. Yes. Yeah, um, and that was. Um, that was actually, and ironically, uh, that actually was a combination of practical effects and CGI. Mm. Um, and Ron was predominantly uh, responsible for the practical uh, elements of that, which, if you watch those shots again, they still hold up very, very well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing was, is at that time, doing complicated particle effects, um, and, and the word fluid dynamics was completely off the radar um, at that point. This <laughs> yeah. was late, eight, late 90s. You know, it, the word fluid dynamics was known, um, but that was still supercomputer region. Um, yeah. You know, now now 
the three D lightweight three D had moved on to PCs at this point. Although actually they were using some other some deck alphas and some other, but um, but deck fluid alphas. dynamics doing doing complicated particles mm. was still not possible. It just wasn't possible. So for that episode, this is this is where Ron kicks in. Um, you know, basically looked at what they had to do for that episode, and it was like, well, what we'll do is we'll get the cameras out. Um, we'll we'll build um, essentially black slash green chunks of Voyager um, and then we'll go outside with some high speed cameras and we'll do it old school. We will basically drag uh, these shapes that look like the bottom of the Voyager, the front of the Voyager and the engines of the Voyager. We'll drag them through baking soda um, Mm. and film it at high speed and then we'll comp those elements into the CGI elements and get the result that they got yeah. so when you see so that you know that that and that's exactly when you're talking about the whole you know working for the bbc effects you know and, and going through yeah. that thing that's exactly what you're going to do you're like okay we need to create these impossible shots how do we create these impossible shots okay well we combine what we've learned before with the new stuff and put it together and that was what ron was was very much um you know, that was his thing. That was perfect. You know, that was exactly what he would do. He was very much about pushing forward with new stuff and new ideas, but not forgetting all the old stuff. Yeah. You know, and, and not just throwing out, which a lot of people today in CGI, to be perfectly honest, they're more focused on their mail scripts and their, you know, whatever's and their, 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 um, Lucas, uh, Lucas. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the, the, you know, but it's more, it's more technical. It's more yeah. mechanical. It's more, you know, uh, it's not artistic. Um, a lot of them are, of course, and brilliant ones. But there's a lot of people who just don't have, you know, and, and because they didn't have that, you know, they didn't weren't in that transition period, you mm. know, where you've gone from doing stuff with models and miniatures and transitioning into CGI, and you can fall back and use some of those as it were what nowadays they call old school techniques but um but the thing is is sometimes they're better you know um and quicker and cheaper and and, and affordable you know um so that's what they did so yeah so he got an, an emmy nomination for for timeless um and i'm trying to remember what they lost to but um but unfortunately they did lose on that one mm-hmm. um and then um um he was also nominated uh, uh, for a, uh, a TV movie called Superfire, mm. um, which I was on the same Emmy nomination. That was my first Emmy nomination uh, with Ron. So if you want another time when you have a, a very stiff drink, um, that's when, you know, okay, so fast forward a couple of years after I was hired at Foundation, I'm you know, I'd, I'd uh, been there on Voyager for a couple of years, and then I moved on to this um, uh, project with Ron. So now I was actually, was actually that was the first time because on Voyager, Ron was actually running the company at that point and wasn't so much hands on with Voyager. So of course he was there. He was the figurehead. He was the you know the um, uh, the one that that, that kept you know he, he would kept the lights pop, on. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't even just keeping. It wasn't so much about keeping the lights on. It was. It was, you know, it was more about sort of influencing and, yeah. and would, would sort of come around and, and see stuff that was going on and would look at stuff and would suggest something or would point at something. Or how about you try this? Or that looks cool. That looks like shit. Why are you doing that? That, you know, that looks cool. cool. That looks cool. You know, um, you know, he'd much rather be saying that's cool and, and carry on, you know. Um, mm. But if it, you know, um, normally you just wouldn't show him anything unless you knew he was going to say that's cool. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, but, um, but then, uh, but yeah, he, he was, uh, um, overseeing, uh, this, uh, TV film called Superfire mm. and he was the effect supervisor for that. And, and I, um, I had actually done a little personal project with a plane on it. Um, and I'd, I'd shown it to, to Ron and a couple of the other, because this, you remember I'm, I was like, you know, junior, junior guy at this point still. You, you, you were still arg man back then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, um, so anyway, I, I did this test of an aircraft, um, just did it as a personal project because I wanted to try and do it. It was a, of a, um, a World War II aircraft. And mm. anyway, I showed it to some people at, at Foundation, um, the, you know, the upper guys, the, the, better, the, you know, the, the top guys, as it were. 
And um, they were like, oh, 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 you can do that. OK. Mm. <laughs> and um, that essentially got me the, the job working uh, on um, on Superfly, which was this, as I say, it was a, a TV movie. It, I'm not going to say it was that good. It was, it was OK. <laughs> it was a very good experience for me. Very small crew, not a very big budget. So it was kind of, let's put it this way, it was almost like the Sharknado of its time uh, before, you know. So mm. it was basically a disaster movie of the week on a TV budget where where two forest fires join together to create a super fire. And, um, you know, basically you got like, um, you know, two guys and an old DC-3 who have got to put out this fire. Mm. Um, you know, because everything else, everybody else is dead or everything else has gone wrong and they have to save the day. And um, I won't give away the ending, but they put the fire out. Um, <laughs> but this, so, so this was the first time when I got to actually work directly with Ron. Mm. Um, and yeah, so you're talking about, you know, we there was a very small team. Um, we all we, you know, we were all down in the trenches and, and working like crazy. And it was great. And then, you know, it it aired and um, I had actually gone off to work on a, another project. Um, and um, yeah, then I got the call up about, you know, getting an Emmy nomination. So getting a call that you got an Emmy nomination was huge. Um, it was the first time, you know, for me, hmm. but then, you, you know, if you want the whole taking a stiff drink thing, you're on the Emmy nomination with Ron, who was like the, the, you know, the, the person that you'd, you'd like, I want to go work for him almost 10 years before then at this point, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. And now you get to put on a tux and go to a thing and you're sitting at the table with him. And yeah, that, that was another very stiff drink moment, uh, <laughs> you know? Um, and it was cool, but there was always, but there was always the, you know, encouragement and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? I was going to say, that was the thing. I was going to say, what was he, what was he actually like to work with? Because, you know, I mean, I've only spoken, <laughs> I only spoke to him. I only spoke to him twice. And right. And when I did, he came across, across as kind of sort of dry wit and no nonsense. I think is probably the best way of putting it. That that's pretty much it. Yeah, there there wasn't you know there wasn't any deep you know uh, I'm not gonna uh, you know there wasn't any sort of like deep mystery or or whatever. No, it was uh, yeah uh, 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 very much a dry wit mm. and very much no 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 nonsense. It mm. was um, you know. Uh, a combination of you know how do we get this done mm. and how do we make it better yeah um and that pretty much boils down to it then it was like you know okay where are we gonna go for dinner uh, <laughs> what are we gonna make for the what the barbecue there's uh, a great quote also, here there's huh? a great quote here on the cinefix article it says slap a few nernies on it coat of paint walk away yes yes Yes, yes. He's credit, credited with inventing the, or, or, or bringing to the forefront the, the word nerny, um, mm. which is a, a, another, that's a whole other story on its own. But um, yeah, yeah nerny is the CGI equivalent of greeble, um, which is basically putting random things on something to make it look like it does something important. Yeah. Um, doesn't sound like much, but yeah. Um, the, the the ultimate expression, the easiest way to, to describe that is uh, the Millennium Falcon. Um, if you look at the Millennium Falcon, where it looks like it's all these kind of bits that are just sort of slapped on, but they, they're they just chunks of things and modifications and things like this. But but it, you don't know what any of it is, but it just kind of looks like it works and it makes the Millennium Falcon work. And we all know that it works and it's sort of strapped together. <laughs> those those details that are on the outside of the, of the ship and on the inside, to be perfectly honest, um, in a different way, are, are greebles. Um, and um, uh, some people call them, uh, is it widgets? Um, yep. or, or, yeah, that's the other term. Um, that's kind of the British term and the American term is greebles. Um, but, but Ron referred to them as nernies in the CGI world. And so, because he basically built the similar sort of thing for Babylon five to detail out the, the star furies and, and Babylon five station and stuff like that, by ba basically making small random looking stuff that, that gave it a, a, an appearance of having a function. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was pivotal. Yes. Um, which, to anything. which kind of goes back to kind of harks back to his, um, model making sort yeah. of roots. Oh, again, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Because, because before CGI, the Greebles and that, you know, you took uh, model kit parts. So you'd, you'd take a Panzer tank or a 
or a battleship or something else. Um, and you'd, you'd basically rip the model kit apart, find all those bits from the suspension and the engines and stuff like that. And that's what became, that's how you made a Millennium Falcon, essentially, because that's what all those Because they're not are. gearboxes and engine parts on the side of it, honestly. <laughs> not at all. No, no. Um, you know, um, I, I, I love pointing out on, on the side of the Battlestar Galactica, the original Battlestar Galactica on the, on the miniature, um, there's a, right by the, where the name, where the name Galactica is, um, there's a, a grill off of a, a Jeep, a Willys Jeep, you know, World War II Willys Jeep. Hmm. Um, the grill, you know, with the, that very iconic, with the with the the two headlights and those sort of hot dog slats, mm-hmm. yeah. um, are right on there. Um, but we're not talking about that. We're we're talking about Ron. Um, but no, but he, <laughs> that's exactly what he would do. Is is, is putting it's putting those details in. So as far as what Ron's like as a person, yeah, hmm. down to earth, no messing around. It, you know, it, it, no 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 BS. Um, yeah. You know, well, okay, I say no BS. There's a lot of BS, but only when it isn't important um when it when it was important and when it mattered and when you know you had to get the job done then there was no bullshit yeah um afterwards over a beer then there was lots of it <laughs> um, an awful lot you know yeah um yeah and the, the other thing that uh, that you know uh you know I, to be honest i really wish he'd been able to write a biography but um but he he, he didn't have time um, no unfortunately because it would have been quite a Quite a book, um, because half of it could have been a cookbook. Um, because what one thing most people don't realize is he was a, a very avid uh, cook. Mm. Um, across, I, I heard he was a bit of a gourmet. Yeah. Uh, very much, yeah. Um, especially when it involved Asian food, especially Thai uh, or barbecue, um, mm. one for the other. So that was uh, that was definitely his forte. Um, at, at Foundation Imaging, once it grew to a large a large company. Um, they they would have company barbecues, you know. Mm. Um, before I was there, it was basically having a you know a, a Weber gas grill, you know, because there was ten people or whatever. But once it grew to a hundred odd people, I remember he he built these huge, basically he built custom built these huge two huge racked um, barbecues, basically um, to be able to cook enough food for like two hundred people at a time. Mm. Um, uh, because that was what he, that was the sort of person he was. It was like, if we're having a barbecue, we're having a barbecue and it's going to be <laughs> real barbecue. And, and his ribs were incredible. Um, everybody, you ask anybody, if you've been to a Ron barbecue, um, yeah, everybody would talk about his, uh, cooking of his spare ribs. So yeah, um, very much, uh, uh, uh a sh- a sh- I don't think gourmet is the right <laughs> word because he wasn't like. A, you know, when you say the word gourmet, it's a little bit foo foo which mm. you, you, you're true. quite precious about stuff, isn't it? Well, I think yeah, it was more. But and he was, um, mm. but he was also he, the thing was the the thing I do remember about Ron as for his cooking um, was that he liked to experiment and try different things out. He would constantly like if if you were working with him and if he was doing something, he would constantly bring something in and be like, here, try this, try this. And like, what do you think? And you'd be like, oh, this and this. And, 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 you know, because he wanted your feedback because he would be trying uh, a different recipe out or a different way of cooking something or a different combination of spices or whatever. Mm. And, um, yeah, when you know, when you say down to earth and practical, I mean, that was that was true. It was true for, for work and for CGI, and it was true about, you know, um, uh, his pastimes. Yeah. Um, you know, um, which cooking was, was one of his big pastimes. The other big pastime of his was flying. Um, yes, he had a Yak-3, was it? Uh, Yak-3, unfortunately, no. It was the poor no. man's Yak-3. Oh, okay. Yak-52. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think he would have loved a Yak-3. <laughs> um, but no, it was a Yak-52. He had two, he had two different Yak-52s, and uh, he had, uh, I believe, a Piper um, before I um, was... was as it were in, in the club to be able to go fly with him <laughs> um, right. because it took, you know, it took a few years, but yes, um, no, he, he was a, um, um, a fully, I, I don't even know how many hundreds or thousands of hours, um, he had, um, but was very experienced, uh, especially in, uh, his, his definite love was, was, uh, he had a, a soft spot for, obviously for, for, um, uh, British, you know, RAF stuff, but for, uh, Russian stuff as well. Mm. That was very much his uh, his forte, um, and uh, yeah, he had a uh, he had what's called a Yak fifty two TD, which was a tail dragger. So um, it, the Yak fifty two was a, a Russian trainer, um, mm. 
and uh, relatively easy uh, to fly and relatively easy, uh, cheap to, to buy, affordable, um, surprisingly affordable to buy. A lot of people, a lot of people own them, and he had one uh, for a few years, and then he he sold that off, and then he bought a what's called a TD, which was a conversion, um, you know, basically taking a Yak 52 and turning it from a, a fairly plain looking typical uh, um, uh, trainer, very, very bland type mm. of thing, into what looked like a, a, a high performance uh, tail dragger. So yeah. um, with a, uh, uh, he had a custom paint job that he did. He designed all the decals and all the markings, um, had uh, Dom Lavery, uh, who he worked with on Captain Scarlet, do some nose art for it. Um, nice. He even had the thing um, wired, although it never actually uh, came to fruition, for having, um, uh, he was going to put like HD, uh, this was before webcams, but basically little HD cameras uh, on the wingtips um, so that he could go flying and get cool footage from it. So, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, and it was always, you know, so he was always thinking about, well, what could I use this for for work so then I can write it off on my tax <laughs> you know, Yeah, um, write it off as a tax thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, you know. So it's like, oh, well, I can go get some, oh, we need some aerial footage for that. Um, no, it's a spaceship film, Ron. Well, well, we might need some flying through clouds, so all right, off we go. That's You're still on Sequest DSV. <laughs> You're <Yeah>. underwater. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but, you know, no, so, yes, um, mm. Definitely dry humor, definitely. Um, but yeah. but yeah, always, always. Uh... I mean, again, me and Leon, me and Lee Medcalf only spoke Hello. to him briefly, but he was very. He'd it, it, always take the time to answer questions, but I mean, I, yeah. I know where you currently are. I, Ron had something to do with that as well, wasn't it? Kind of just. He um, was working on talking Tom or something as well, was he? Yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, it's the other way around. Um, oh, okay, I actually, I actually, well, um, I actually got him on uh, the uh, essentially the job on talking Tom. Um, because I knew that they, what it was, was they were looking for a producer. Uh-huh. Um, and I was just like, well, Ron's done multiple animated projects before. Hmm. Um, give him a shout and see if he's uh, available. I wasn't sure what he was doing at the time. Um, but I got, to, I worked with Ron actually at four different locations um, on four different projects over the, over the past 15 years. Um, 17 years actually now, Jesus. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I worked for him um, at Foundation Imaging in, in California uh, on Voyager and Superfire. And then um, after Foundation closed, uh, he went off and did other projects. And then he got hired uh, by Jerry Anderson um, to help save the new Captain Scarlet TV series, which was being yeah. made in the, the UK. Oh, uh, yeah, the CG um, one, wasn't it? it the was CG one, Early yeah, 2000s. Um, it, it was uh, 2005. Okay. Around, around 2005. Um, yeah, there's a whole other story that can. I don't want to go into the full ins and outs and all of that. But basically, mm-hmm. the, he was brought in to essentially well, to fix all the shit and, and, and make it work. Um, and the thing was, is he, like all of us, really, he, one of his major influences as a kid was, was Jerry Anderson shows. You know, Thunderbirds, of course. Mm. He's a huge Thunderbirds fan. And. Um, so, you know, the chance to go work with Jerry, um, well, I was just obviously not going to turn that down. Um, plus, it was well paid, but that was a whole other thing. Um, but really, it was just, you know, seriously, you know. Anyway, um, when, when he realized what was going on, he actually contacted me um, uh, because he knew that I was a huge Anderson fan. Um, and um, another, I don't think I had a stiff drink that time because I <laughs> probably was used to it at this point, but I should have, thinking about right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he contacted me. He'd been flown over to, to Pinewood by Jerry to, to talk about how we're going to do it. He contacted me about it, and I'm just like, and I was actually busy. I'm not going to work in another project. But basically, it was just like, well, we need to, we need to put together a, a team of people to fix this thing, and, and he contacted me. And um, literally, like two or three days later, I took some vacation time, a few days off, I'm at LAX getting on, and, and here's where the sort of irony and full circle, I'm getting on a Virgin Atlantic 747 called Lady Penelope <laughs> to fly to London to meet with Ron and Jerry Anderson nice. to talk about Captain Scarlet. <laughs> now, if that's not, I, I don't even, as I say, I think at that point I probably didn't have a stiff drink because I'm just like, well. You need, you need a smelling salts, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, 
<laughs> so yeah, talk about you know surreal. So you know here I am, you know essentially going into Pinewood Studios, which I'd never been to before, which was like you know that was kind of like a you know like the Holy Land or whatever to go to go visit Pinewood Studios mm. to meet have a meeting you know with with Jerry Anderson, uh, with Ron bringing me in to do this you know and it's like how does that happen um seriously <laughs> Jeez. yeah now, by, by now lucky. by now you're dosed up to the nines with a stiff drink yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you know but the thing was you know um but that was what ron you know he he you know he he you know he would bring in people that wasn't you know had the enthusiasm that he had for mm. the property and and the, the making the show that was sort of what was the the the, the key i think for for, mm. for me was because you, know, the thing is, is you you can hire people to do a job, but if you bring people in that have that enthusiasm, they're going to do more. Yeah, they're going to do more for that job, you know, yeah. and they're, they're going to make it. You know, they're going to make the whole project a bit better. So, hmm. um, yeah. I mean, um, with with obviously he worked on so many things as did you. Right, I mean, well, did yeah, you? But, but did you ever get the sense that there was one particular show he always? you know, had the, you know, the fondness he'd always return to or one that he always uses a touchstone for everything else. Was there like a, a, a key episode, a key thing that he just was like constant, you know, the proudest moment or was he just um, like every th- job? He, the thing is, is he, uh, as far as his own stuff, you know, that he mm. worked on, I mean, he would talk about stuff and, and we would, you know, I, cause I would you know, remember he was working, he'd worked on stuff before I was in the industry that mm. I was, you know, an, an influence, you know, that influenced me, mm. uh, Spaceballs, you know, but, um, <laughs> um, but, but as far as like for him, I think really it was Jerry Anderson, you know, Jerry Anderson would come up all the time, um, mm. or Jerry Anderson shows yeah. would come up all the time. Um, and I mean, he, he actually had several projects that he tried to get going himself, mm. um, you know, but that's you know, I mean, he did do some like hypernauts, which definitely have a sort of a Jerry Andersonish t- uh, twinge to it. Um, yeah. But there was other. There was a project called Vortex um, that was, v- if you you know, uh, it was very much a, a, a essentially a, you know Ron making a Jerry Anderson show, but with his taking all of those influences that he had as a kid and then doing his own thing with it and going on, you know, and and, and doing his own show. That only got as far as doing like a promo, and unfortunately never sold. But that was definitely something. So yeah, he would always go back to. Um, but as far as like the stuff that he had worked on and stuff, he didn't. He never really sort of dwelled on stuff. It wasn't like he walked around and went, "Yeah, I did Babylon Five. Ugh. No, it, <laughs> that was that was already done and move on. It was like, what's the next thing that can be done? So yeah. no, he he definitely wasn't. You know, it wasn't like he had a. A, a Babylon Five necklace on that you know was like yeah. hanging around it. No, that was big, totally big tattoo crazy. across the back. You know, yeah, no, that was it was completely the opposite to that. It was completely opposite to that. It was like, yeah, yeah that was cool. We're moving on, you know. Um, yeah. um, but I would, you know, the thing is, is I would bug him, you know. Um, I mean, so for example, you know, last year when um, you know he was, we were both here in uh, in Vienna working on uh, Talking Tom, um, and um, I don't remember how it came up, um, but the subject of, of Blake Seven came up, and mm. um, you know when I was a kid, I mean, uh, you know, um, Blake Seven was that was a huge show, you know, yeah. that was a that was a big deal. Um, I made the mistake in the in the like somewhere in the nineties of buying one of the VHSs of like <laughs> the first episodes and watching you know, because that was when you know in the early nineties when VHS you know like buying the TV shows on VHS was a big thing. I remember <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, I can watch Babylon Blake Seven again. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna buy that. And then I remember watching the first episode and going, "This is shit." <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it hadn't aged well. <laughs> it didn't age too well. Um, so, but the the weird was so a couple of years ago when when we were here, I can't remember how it came up, but I was like, it kind of came up somewhere, um, and it would have been him bringing it up. It would have been me. Um, yeah. Asking him about it because I was like, "Oh, you worked on Blake yeah, Seven or whatever." And so anyway, I went back and watched all of them again, and um, it's actually, actually, if you just watch them, there's about half of the episodes are actually still really, really good. Mm. Um, about half of the episodes are really no, don't age well at all. But yeah, um, but the the shows where they where it was being original, it was actually still very good. So 
he was only on the last season. He was only on the season four when the Liberator had been destroyed and he uh, was the main model maker for the Scorpio. Um, yeah. And um, now I was, like all of us, you know, huge fan of the Liberator because the Liberator was just a very cool ship. And especially if you were in, you know, if you were watching TV in the late 70s and the Liberator, I mean, you're just like, that on TV was as important as an X-Wing on on the cinema, you yeah. know, because it, it was very influential. And as me as a kid, it definitely was. So I remember I was asking about it and, and the, the asking about the, the Scorpio um, and and finding out that, you know, because I was like, well, what, you know, what happened to the, the miniature? And um, the, 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 the hero miniature um, was essentially thrown away afterwards because no. in the in the show um, at, the, at the end of the show um, it does this kind of crash landing mm. which they filmed obviously with the miniature and apparently so they they filmed it all and then apparently at the like after the last take or whatever it basically fell off the table at the end <laughs> and sort of smashed now obviously any of us would have scooped them all up and stuck them in a box and glued it back together yeah um, but as far as he knows, and as far as anybody else I can talk to knows, um, that didn't happen, and it went away. The the Liberator was also destroyed at the end of season three, and that was saved. Mm. Um, Matt Irvin um, uh, kept uh, remnants of it, or what's left of it, and still has it. But anyway, so so Ron was involved. He built the, the Scorpio, and so you know, I, I started bugging him. I was like, oh, that would you know, when I when he you know I asked him about it, and then he you know told me it's been destroyed or whatever, and I was like, well. We should build a we should build a replica because he was still he was still a fan of, of building practical stuff. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, you know, if he could have if he could have had a, a project um, that, that was all about building miniatures again and filming them, he would have been all over that. You know, absolutely. In fact, the last conversations I had with him, um, he was actually uh, wanting to scratch build a chipmunk aircraft. Oh. Um, because that's what he had flown in the air cadets when he was a kid. Hmm. Um, and he contacted me to, to get some blueprints, uh, just a few months ago. Um, unfortunately, of course that never, never came to fruition, but, but anyway, so I, I was bugging, I was just like, Oh, we should, we should build a, we should build a replica of the, the Scorpio. Hmm. And, um, so yeah, we, we sat and talked about that for quite a while and, and, uh, you know, he kind of, he actually, I mean, as I say, he never would sort of bring that sort of thing up himself. But if you asked him about that sort of stuff, he was more than happy to, to dig into the back of his mind and try and remember as much as he could. And mm. that would be the same with any of the projects with B5. I mean, he, would, he wouldn't he would necessarily bring up B5. But if anybody asked him about it, and it didn't matter whether it was, you know, a, a high-end VFX supervisor from a feature film or if it was, you know, me or Joe Schmo on the street yeah. or whatever, you know, be quite happy to to answer the questions about it. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I think that was my one of my first questions to him was <laughs> was about B five because because he did um I I don't know if you remember this but when when the internet was in its sort of nascent sort of there wasn't you know the you know midwinter lurkers yes. guide was still floating about and there was um. Oh god! There was it the um, news groups. Yep. There was the there was the rec B five rec dot B five news group. Yeah, the the bulletin board. The bulletin board, yeah, yes. and yeah. and I I remember I distinctly remember the fact that I'd I'd seen I'd seen an interview with him in the first issue of Computer Arts magazine. Okay. Which actually had a gatefold of B five. Right. Um. So the gatefold cover, and you kind of opened it up. And you get the whole of B five, or at least you know, three quarters of it. And there's a big thing about how he's sort of embracing all this new technology, and you yep. know. And then he mentions the news groups, and through through. Um, well, I don't think he was. I don't think he was particularly prolific, but he was. But he certainly had been on there, and he wasn't mm-hmm. using a username that was just Ron or anything like that. And it was. <laughs> I think it was. It was a mistake on their part, but on the in the in the actual article there was a little picture that said you know you know there's there's a picture of him sitting beside a computer and it goes mm-hmm. ron even interacts with his fans on the internet or something <laughs> like that and, and, um, and through like i was obsessed because i had i i had Lightwave, i had right. it don't ask how i got it but i had it and i had an amiga i had an, I, I i pestered my father i had an amiga and i'd been learning imagine uh which yep. come off the front of amiga power 
Yep. And I was like, right, I'm going to step up into the big leagues. And I and I know and I and and I thought, well, I'm gonna fi- I'm, I'll find him. I'll find him. How do right. I find him? You know, there's none of this Google or any of this sort of stuff. Right. Yes. And I literally, I got. I remember this. I I got this little magnifying glass, <laughs> and I sat there studying this picture until I could basically work out like ninety percent of his username that was sitting <laughs> on this page. <laughs> And uh, uh-huh. I don't, I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever confessed to him precisely how I did it, all of that. How you got, all of it. <laughs> right. but he, yes. but but for you know, for what is obviously now in these days and age, I guess you know, with Twitter and everything, you know, a random just coming up to you and going, "I really like your stuff," you know, is right, it's right. kind of like I think that's kind of par for the course for most people. But I, he took it in good humor that suddenly out of nowhere, this this sort of like. 19 20 year old kid from sort of like bromley had right. on the other side of the planet had suddenly gone hello i'm hoping you're ron thornton i would like to ask you the following question please <laughs> i i am it took a long time for him to reply and i suspect <laughs> that there may have been a lot of what the fuck is this <laughs> right yeah. Yeah, bit, bit busy going around securing all the doors and windows I imagine. <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. early early 4chan doxing sort of action you know <laughs> just call me anonymous but um no he was he was yeah but the, my question was literally how did you build a star fury mm. and and he uh, f- fair credit to him he he was quite open about the whole process mm. and you know but he was talking about lightwave and i'd literally all i'd done is i'd managed to get lightwave on like 10 floppy disks 750 <laughs> 720 meg a 720k yes. floppy disk. So, it would, yes. it, by the time I'd read the entire article, I was still on like disk five, <laughs> loading it up, and um, yeah, he was he was really open, and it was really amazing because it was like one of those things where you kind of, I you know, flush of youth, you know, kind of like I, I'm nowadays. I'd think if I tried that, I would be sitting there going, "Oh, why are you asking these people these stupid yeah. things?" But it was just like, "No, I'm going to ask him. He's on the internet. I can get him." <laughs> Right, and he yeah, was really, yeah. he was really cool, dude. He was really open about it, and he actually pointed me in the direction of um, the LWG dot org group, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. which kind of was the Lightwave user group at the yep. time, and then which then became LWG three D dot org, and then Foundation three D, and that's yes. obviously where I ran into Andy, and then. By by extension, yourself and uh, mm-hmm. loads and loads of other people. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and it's it, still going. So yeah. and it is still well, well, going. Just, just just about still going. <laughs> well, let's let's not let's not do that. Let's, let's not, not dwell. Let's not do that conversation. <laughs> let's not. No. Um. But it's it was. I I mean, my last my second question to him was you know. How do you get into this job? And he, <laughs> and, which is the first question everybody asks. <laughs> well, mine, mine was how do you build a Star Fury. The right. second one was, <laughs> the second one was how do you get a job? And right. and he just were he just went something. He, he I I always remember he came back with something really really blunt, and I was like. Okay, I'm not sending him any more. I'm not right. sending him any more questions. <laughs> but, but put it, it this way: if it had been your first question, it would have been your last. <laughs> exactly. It was. It, he sent something like hard work and a lot of luck. Right. Was something very or, or along those lines. I mean, it was. Like, what was it twenty years ago now? So yes, I yes. barely remember my own name, let alone what I was writing twenty years ago. But he, the fact of the matter was, he he just turned around and he just went. You know, if you can speak to people and you can get your foot in the door and talk to them. You know, right. you're you're halfway there, sort of thing. Yeah. But um, and I always and I always remember that, and it, it, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I sort of I look back on it now, and I'm like, oh god. And I, I think I actually sent him a picture that I'd made in Lightwave, and he never replied. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and I yes. yeah, and yes, it wasn't good. It wasn't a good one either. I think he was. I think it was being polite by actually not replying. It was. A, <laughs> It was it was a it was a frog. Well, it, it, you know, to be honest, if it was that bad, he would have replied and ripped it a new one. I, I imagine he would. It yes, was, so yeah. it probably wasn't that bad. <laughs> I but, think. Um, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So, what about you, Andy? When do you? 
Uh, I, I, I used to watch them a couple of times uh, through the miracle of a book of face because <laughs> mm. I, I had them up on that sort of thing. And, and actually, um, the, the two times I really interact with them we're talking about is um, Plane. Uh, most mm. just saying, that looks amazing. That looks really cool. You're a lucky bastard. Um, yes. That, that, that was mm. pretty much the interactions we had. Because again, by the time I'd added him up, you know, it was a long time since Babylon 5 and Star Trek. I mean, I only knew he was still sort of working in industry through um, speaking with Lee. Because uh, I knew he'd done some stuff on the Talking Tom with you, but you know, I, I don't want to say he was in the twilight of his career because I don't think Ron's the sort of person who ever would have stopped working. But he certainly wasn't quite as prolific because you'd had companies like Zoic had popped up, Digital Automation. You know, the CG now is so ubiquitous in everything. Yeah, he, he'd kind of gone from this massive, you know, mountain in well, the industry. Yeah, the thing was is that you know he his the the, the company that he had you know foundation had grown mm-hmm. um, up to uh, two hundred people or so almost you know and uh, I think that wasn't necessarily what he wanted. Um, he was more about actually being on the practical side of things. Yeah, because if you're that big, you, like you said, you've got to keep the lights on. You yeah, don't get as, you don't get as much chance to do the stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so no, I mean, you know, he was, um, um, not involved, but I mean, um, yeah, he, he, you know, jumped around on, on different projects. Actually, as you're talking about Zoic, he actually worked for Zoic for quite a while, oh, yeah? um, and was working, uh, up in their, uh, Vancouver office, uh, for a period as well. That wasn't on Galactica, was it? No, no, no. It was, no? Okay. Uh, um, it was just after that. It was after that. Ah. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly. And then he was teaching for a few years where I also worked with him in... Uh, oh, yeah, Florida. I was going to ask, because it was the yeah. Dave School, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He worked yeah. at. Yep. Um, and I, I was working with him there as well um, on, on various student projects. Um, but no, I mean, he, he kind of bounced around. The thing was, is he'd actually, you know, was always still very, very active in trying to do new stuff. And, and that's actually the hardest thing you, you can do. Um, because trying to get your own projects or working with other people to get projects off the ground is is mind blowingly difficult. Preaching to the choir, my friend. Yeah, yeah <laughs> yes. yes, you know that well. Yeah, um, and so do I. You know, it, it is yeah. very very difficult. So he was actually very active uh, in trying to get some some new projects going. Um, he had worked he worked for a while recently. I'm talking about in the last few years. Uh, in China, uh, at Base Effects, um, who were basically ILM's arm in in uh, in China, um, mm. working on on various uh, larger projects there, um, and then he was also working uh, on a very cool project, which um, I I don't actually remember seeing the end result of what it because I think it was a pilot, but it was basically uh, for a company in in California, back in California, in Los Angeles. Doing real time compositing and real time, uh, you know, you're seeing a lot of stuff right now with with VRs making a big comeback and, mm. and AR yeah. is is like the new buzzword, mm. and this was sort of that, but for actual TV production. So what they were doing is they had um, it was essentially it wasn't even really green screen. It was they had real time motion tracking on everything, including the camera. Um, so they knew where the camera was within a millimeter, I think, or so, in any direction at any time. So they had, you know, when you see like these QR um, barcode things, um, yeah, they had like a version of that, but on all the walls and even on the ceiling and on the floor. Um, and so what it was was the camera basically would always see several of these different um, coded like barcode things at any one point. And so you could literally have the camera moving around almost 360 degrees in real time, and then it would real-time live composite a CGI-generated background onto that. Mm. So you oh, could wow. Film, yeah, so you could film yeah. your actors on essentially a, a virtual green screen, but with a, with a camera that was completely free to move anywhere. And in real time, it would generate the, the backgrounds, and they were using that to... Um, do essentially a, 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 a virtual digital sets hmm. um, affordable because again it was all about you know um, being able to make it affordable and to to push push new stuff. So he was you know um, 
wasn't necessarily working on stuff that was as vis you know uh, visible as you might you know think now, but was definitely trying to do new things. Um, another thing, the the last but one pro the last main project that he was involved in, which was after he was on Tom, um, was was trying to do something like Talking Tom as a as a CGI animated TV show. Um, you know, you still have to animate everything, render everything, composite everything, put everything together, make a show. And that still takes time. And so one of the things that he was working with, uh, the, the last thing that he was really working on, was using um, essentially uh, graphics cards hmm. um, and, and the, the, the GPU power that you're getting these days, um, which is mind-blowing, um, and essentially doing using uh, video game rendering power with the GPU processing power um, to essentially render uh, animated TV or animated feature or whatever hmm. in near real time. Um, so the thing is, it's like, you know, you, you literally can animate your entire movie or your entire TV show. You can then light it. And you could literally, you know, I don't want to say press a button and come back in 20 minutes and it would be there, but pretty close to that. Because if you've got real time and you've got a 20 minute episode yeah, and, and you, you set up your 20 minute episode with your lighting, with your animation, with your characters or whatever, and you want to, you want to see, well, what's this show going to look like? You literally hit play. And, and, in, and now it was going off to essentially a render farm of GPUs. But it, it could, they could, they could generate thousands and thousands of frames uh, every day, if not tens of thousands of frames every day. Hmm. Um, so they could literally re-render the entire thing every day if they needed to, or if they made one change, they could. Re so it's like, oh well, that scene needs to be nighttime. Okay, put in the nighttime lighting. Boom, done. And now you've got, you know, that five-minute scene is re-rendered. Yeah. So he was definitely still actively trying to to do an, an experiment with new stuff. Um, you know, eh, you know, I'm not saying he was like as active as he was obviously, you know, before, but was definitely still trying uh, and definitely still looking for opportunities to try out new things, much in the way I was talking about with this cooking, you know, mm, yeah. was always, was always experimenting, was always like trying out new things, you know, um, and, and looking to see what, what, other, you know, either techniques or, or software or whatever that was coming along uh, to try it out. So, so yeah, maybe not so publicly visible doing stuff, but definitely was. Yeah. So he, he, right up to the end, he was he was kind of pushing himself and learning and yeah, developing. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And I mean, he was, you know, uh, uh, hobby wise, you know, he was like, well, I'm going to make a 3D. You know, he was playing around with 3D printers and stuff like that. You know. Um, building, you know, building his own 3D printer because well, why not? You know, <laughs> using a 3D printer to build a 3D printer. <laughs> actually, they did. They actually did. Yeah. Um, Where's that Inception did. noise? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but, um, so. Uh, okay. Well. <sighs> yeah. I, I think Where we can we also. Yeah, we're, so, we're, yeah, we're, we're all, uh, we're all the, the lesser for having lost him. I think um, absolutely, yeah, and and way too soon, of course, you know, because mm -hmm. fifty nine is, jeez, you know, yeah. I mean, it was uh, a shock. Not... It was a shock to hear he was ill, but then yes, um, <laughs> well, it was it was a shock to him as well, actually, because um, you know, basically, yeah, it came on very quickly, and I think once, basically, what it, it, the simple version is, I don't want, I don't want to get into the details, um, but. Yeah, basically when they realised, it was one of those things when they realised that there was a problem, it was essentially too late to do anything about it. Yeah. Um, so then it was just like, well, let's just make make the most of it. And yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah. The the worst thing I, I, I can tell, I mean, um, the worst thing that I could tell from him personally um, that he hated about the being sick was that his um, appetite went to zero. Yeah. Um, and he he went off food. He, he the the um, you know his illness killed his essentially killed his taste buds and killed his you know interest in food. 
Yeah. Um, his mind still wanted to, to cook and to eat and to you know, experiment and do all this. And then his body wouldn't. And I know that that really, he really hated that um, mm. because he had no, he suddenly, you know, one of his biggest passions, he had he, he, like suddenly had, uh, you know, couldn't, couldn't do anymore. And I know that definitely, uh, uh, you know, wasn't fun. Wasn't no. Fun, no. Yes. Right. But um, yeah, uh, it's definitely a, a big loss. Um, yeah. You know. But you know the the, the main thing to remember, I think, um, is the you know we're all gonna, we're all going to go. Um, <laughs> but I think the main thing to remember for Ron is the the influence. And the the you know everybody uses the word legacy. I don't know if that's necessarily, the word, but yeah, it probably is the right yeah, word for I think so. Yeah, yeah again, there's the, so the, many people know, doing it today. Yeah, exactly. And anyone anyone working today in CG? I mean, we know we both know uh, Reese Slaukum over at um, Double Neg, at Double Neg, and all that. Yeah. Just worked on a new Star Trek film. I know for a fact. Again, it was things like Babylon Five brought him into the CG. Yeah, uh, yeah. and you've got all these people now who are out there working on yeah you know, the, the Marvel films. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Star yeah, Trek, yeah. new Star Wars. I mean, a lot of that has to be on. Yeah, thousands, thousands. Um, as I say, there's. I mean, I know several hundred people. You know, at least if not more, that obviously you know got into this because one way or the other. Um, Either either directly through Ron hiring them or influence them or teaching them at school, or just through influence of, of seeing you know things like B five and, and Trek and whatever. Um, but yeah, there has to for all those hundreds that I know, there has to be hundreds more or thousands more. There has to be, and so you know that you know I, I guess in a way you can't um, have much of a better legacy than that. Yeah. Well, I, I I know for a fact that there are yeah. many 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 stiff drinks are going to be raised in his honor over the coming weeks. Yes, yeah. you know, there's, yes. There's, there's a yes. lot of, there's a lot of get-togethers and all that to remember him yes. and his work. I, I mean, I think you know Ron's in the same sort of league as someone like you know Doug Trumbull in terms of the influence they've had on, on the other people. Yes, yeah, yeah and yeah, other people know, and everything. Um, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean that you know when you think you know yeah, I mean because you've got. When you think in this sort of industry, you, you've got people like you know Dick Smith in, in the makeup side of things, mm -hmm. or um, you know you've got people like Stan Winston on, on the sort of the makeup, but then also like animatronic you know, yeah. kind of side of things. And um, yeah, I mean you've got other other people in in visual effects, as you say, you know, um, like um, you know Dykstra or, or uh, Nall or, or Trumbull and, and you know mm. and these kind of guys. I mean the, the go on forever with that sort of list and yeah they they've all had uh influence you know and and major influence and um but they're all very down to earth you know i i don't know the you know some of those guys well personally some of them have gone now you know yeah um but the thing is is you know people when you you know you know i've i've met some of them and they're in there they, they do actually have a very similar attitude to to what ron had in the you know, they want to push things. They want to try out new things. I mean, Doug Trumbull is constantly still um, experimenting and, and innovating and, and very much uh, in that same sort of vein as, as Ron was um, in, mm. in trying out new things. Um, you know, so, yeah, there, there is a sort of a, there does seem to be a, a, a thread there. But, yeah, Ron's legacy, I think, is that there are hundreds, if not thousands of people involved in VFX today. Um, that may well not have been, um, yeah. if if not for for B five, you know, and uh, that's that's a good legacy to have, I think. You yeah, know, you really can't can't have much, but you know, what else can you? Have? Yeah. No, I mean he, I mean you know, going back to what you were saying about all the um, all the equipment and the literal you know impossibility of owning some of this stuff back in the day. I mean, mm. his ultimately his legacy is that he democratized visual effects. He literally yeah, yeah, brought it to the common people as well. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. No, no. It sounds but pompous, yeah. but that that um, is exactly what I mean. It's you know, yeah, you know. It, well, it made it. It made it. As I say, for me, it, it was that it was. It, it felt like it was within arm's reach, or at least it was visible. Yeah, you know, because as I say, for me, you know, yeah, I'd been, I'd been, you know, uh, following the progression of, of CGI from 
fairly early Pixar days, you know, mm. and, and things like Tron and Last Starfighter and, and, you know, heading into things like, you know, Abyss and, and then into Jurassic Park. I had been, you know, I'd been following that sort of stuff and I'm like, this is cool. This is the future. I know this is the way it's all going to go. But but all of that was always out of reach. Yeah. I, I, never, th- I never felt like I would be able to do that. Mm. Um, and then, as I say, B5 came along. And then shortly after and around that time, there was Sequest came along. And, and you know, I went, well, I, I think, you know, at least that was, was achievable, was, was reachable um, mm. in one way or another. And, yeah, and obviously there were hundreds of thousands of other people who, who got that same sort of message and that same influence. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, for me, for me, it was exactly that. I mean... I, I remember saving up five hundred pounds to go on a on a studio course at Silicon Graphics, oh, right. uh, and uh, in Soho Square, mm-hmm. and sitting down in front of an Indigo Two with Power yes. Animator, and yes. thinking, right, okay, fine, I'm going to build something. And this guy showed me how to basically make a box and make it fly <laughs> around, and I'm thinking, okay, I can already do this in Lightwave, right? And then all of a sudden. <laughs> But then, but I'm still sitting there with visions of Jurassic Park and what have you <laughs> flying around in my head. Where's the make dinosaur button? Exactly. <laughs> Where is the make cool shit button? And yes. um, and then F9, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> F9. That's the render. Yeah, but um, but I always remember asking the tutor. I was saying, right, okay, this stuff obviously has power and it obviously is very, very cool. How much? And he said, "Well, the Indigo Two will, you know, a base unit Indigo Two will be forty-five grand, and yeah. you know, Power Animator is another fifteen, and the Onyx server over there is a hundred and twelve, and it's right. like, yeah, right. So what I'm basically <laughs> playing on here to make a box fly around is two hundred and fifty grand's worth of kit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, and I went back, and I literally went back to to my Amiga, yep. sat there for a." an hour and a half trying to load Lightwave and thought, mm-hmm. actually, <laughs> this is about the same. It just takes longer to load. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, no, I was exactly the same. I, you know, I, I had an Amiga and I'm like, okay, I can do that. I, I never did actually have a toaster. I never actually got into uh, uh, to Lightwave until I moved over to a PC mm. um, and um, uh, had a, a special extended trial version for a while, um, and then and then until I could afford to to, to buy uh, the real one, you know. Yeah. Um. I I certainly uh, wanted to. I just couldn't. Um. Yeah. But I. But it, it's funny you say that you, the, the course. I mean, I I very much remember um, scrounging together five hundred. I was living in the U.S. at the time, scrounging together five hundred dollars to buy um, a a copy of Imagine Three D. Um, oh God, for, yeah. For um, my uh, my PC, um, only to install it on my new 486 that I bought, you know, sometime before that, mm. um, and for the, then to uh, to load up the software and then for it to come up and tell me that it needed a, a math coprocessor um, <laughs> in order for it to run this software, and then realizing I didn't have one. Yeah, um, but that's a whole other story. So yes, I mm. mean, uh, it, bringing it uh, as I say within reach um mm. was was critically important yeah you know? so. <sighs> yeah sad loss sad loss yeah 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 it's, it's, uh, i mean you know uh, i don't know about you but i mean you know for the last two days my facebook has been a, a series a just continuous line thankfully it's replaced the the images of continuous line of trump's yes uh, face on on my facebook um and has replaced it with uh, either Ron or or pictures of things that Ron's been involved with. A lot of a mm. lot of star viewers and B five stations have been uh, and, uh, a bit, a bit of generic right. panels, generic, yeah, <laughs> generic B, panels, B five yes, generic yes, panel, uh, B five whole grey. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. You know the funny thing is we we actually joked for the for those of you anybody's actually still listening to this after my ramblings for the last hour and a half. Yeah. Um, I'm sure well they done. Are. Um, <laughs> we, we, should, we should send you a T-shirt, but no, there's there's a texture map called um, Hull Five uh, B Five Hull Gray, um, mm. which is this uh, texture that Ron made back in the early '90s um, that that was essentially a, a generic kind of a panel grunge thing, um, and uh, it's it's funny because that that there are so many people. Uh, I I I. <laughs> 
I don't want to say that I got it legitimately, but I got it legitimately because I copied it off the server at Foundation. <laughs> um, so it at least came from the source, but uh, it has you know many people. But anyway, but the thing is, is it's a, it's it's this it's this texture map um, that um, people still use. You know, if I if I was building a spaceship model today, um, I would find a way to put that on there somewhere. Yeah, um, I would because. Of, it's, it, it still works, and it would, yeah. It's yeah. the CGI version of the Wilhelm scream. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, even if it didn't need it, I'd put it in there just so I could say... It, it is, is, it, is it on the Galactica? Of course. Cool. Oh, uh, good. As I say, it goes without saying, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, There's actually... It's, it's actually a variant of it. Um, the, the main... Actually, to be honest, the main texture on the Galactica... Um, is it's not the the B five whole grey, but it was it's essentially a, a an upgraded version of it. So it's, um, so it's, it's the BSG whole grey. <laughs> uh, essentially, yeah, it was actually uh, Errol Lanier made it, um, but it is basically the same the same thing, but just a, essentially a higher res, more detailed version of that of mm. that. Um, but the in ninety five percent of the texturing on the Galactica is with that texture map. It's the Galactica version of the B, you know the whole the mm. B five uh, whole gray. But the, we're talking about the B five whole gray. Um, um, we joked for many years, and we've still never done it, and we really should do it about getting it um, made as a t shirt. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. But, and I'm not talking about having it printed on a t shirt. I'm talking about having some fabric printed with that as a tiled texture, and then having that made into t shirt. So the entire t shirt is. <laughs> Is, is essentially UV mapped with B5 <laughs> gray. Um, because I think if you went, if you if we made one and went to a SIGGRAPH or something with it, you would just be the talk of the whole place because everybody would know what it was. At least, yeah. mate, if if you're coming to that drink in December, yeah, do, do it. Bring some. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> I think for that one, I'd have to just actually print it on the front of a shirt. Um, yeah. In fact, you should do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, because that would be yes, that would be perfect. awesome. Um, but we had awesome. we had talked about yeah, we had talked about having it made up as a t shirt. You know. <laughs> and those that know would know, and those that didn't would be confused. Yes, <laughs> but that's the best sort of joke, isn't it? Yeah, it is, exactly. <laughs> yes. uh, the ultimate yes. in joke. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So then. anyway, we should probably wrap this up because uh, if anybody's still listening, they're falling asleep at this point. No, no nonsense. Yes. And, 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 and I think I think as we said, if everyone should go out, have a stiff drink, and raise a glass to Ron. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. And and uh, then go cook some uh, barbecue ribs. Yeah. Um, uh, or some Thai food. Because, yeah. um, Anything with uh, red chilies in it, because there's lots of pictures on his Facebook of him oh standing near God, red chilies. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that was kind of a personal challenge of what is the hottest thing I can find, uh, and then what can I combine the two hottest things I can find together to make it even hotter. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that definitely was. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure he always remembered to wash his hands. Yes. <laughs> yes. Unlike yes. some people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's a different story for another day. Yeah, did it once, won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> yes, so to yeah. Ron. To Ron, yes. yes. Thank you thank you to to, to Lee for being yeah, here. Thank, thank you for joining us and sharing thank, yeah. uh, your stories with us. Yes. Yep. And um and yeah, as as we said right at the beginning, you know, you know, Ron Ron's legacy is is far wide, far and wide and long, you know, and it, it, can't it be underestimated. No sense, it, it, we're not lying when we say none of none, none of the three of us would be where we are today without the influence of Ron. So we yeah, really do a, a no, massive, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm still uh, trying. No, to, I'm still trying to decipher his be is uh, how to build a Star Fury instructions. I mean, you know, one day I'll have it finished. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of these days <laughs> one of these days there's an email from 1992 um, yes. it's on my AOL account um, <laughs> you, have start, you have to start pestering Steve Berg next <laughs> yeah exactly but anyway um, yeah thank you Lee thank you for You're sharing welcome. your uh, memories and uh, thank you Andy we, we'll, we'll have you back again under more pleasant circumstances to continue your Galactica essays. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, but that, that means I'm going to have to listen to the first one so I don't just say the same things over again. <laughs> no, that's why we have Andy edit these things, you see. He, yeah, he does that. Yeah, they yeah, I, I, I just make me do that. You yeah. have to get somebody to actually like listen to because I don't want to listen to my own voice because that's horrid. Um, <laughs> 
and listen to my own. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to get somebody to actually listen to it and like make some like spot notes. Okay, talked about this, talked about this, talked about this, yeah. talked about this. <laughs> Yeah. Again and again and again, and then I can go. Okay, don't talk about all those things again, and, and yeah, come up with some new stuff. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, we'll definitely have you on again, sir. That be definitely for, for right. sure. Um, so uh, yeah, so we've been talking to Lee Stringer um, um, about Ron Thornton, a VFX genius, a great influence upon us all, and without whom, I'm sure that some of your best and most favourite visual effects moments will probably have never existed. So. Until next time, thank you again uh, for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Again, to Ron. To Ron. All right.